And one of my acts is that I am the curator of the Kaiba Gallery. Um, the Kaiba Gallery is now in its 17th year, and it's created an opportunity for us to bring in exhibitions, and with those exhibitions, to have conversations about the built environment, about design, um, and about um, our relationship to other um, disciplines and among the disciplines in the school. As part of that, we often host symposium, like the affordable housing symposium we had in the fall, and we have lectures and gallery talks. And this semester, we wanted to kind of keep working on the idea of housing. And um, so today had the opportunity, really wonderful opportunity, um, to invite Omar Hakim, who will speak to us today about their work and about a particular project, the Rapido Housing Project. But before I start that, I wanted to just um, put this in another context, which is a context that I think is relevant to all of us, whether we are faculty, whether we are starting out designers, whether we're working on our thesis, um, whether whatever discipline we're in, which is the question about how we frame our questions and how we frame our research, our practice, and our scholarship. And so the idea that how we frame and pose um, questions that guide our work, those questions shape the parameters of the possible solutions and of the um, principles and goals of what we're after. And so today, the Rapido Housing Project, I think, and a lot of the other work that BC Workshop does, is, has been started by posing a question in a different manner than we're used to posing it. And as a result of asking that question differently, we are able perhaps to move forward on some of the complex issues that we haven't been able to do so before. So in every project you have, when you're given a project, within those projects, you have the opportunity to frame your own set of questions and keep them, you know, think about that opportunity and look for ways in which people have framed the question in another way that leads an open possibility or a set of possibilities that perhaps weren't imagined before. So in the Rapido housing project, for example, um, when, we're, when we're faced with the challenge of providing homes after disaster-based loss, the first reaction or the typical reaction and goal is to provide quick and economical shelter for people who've lost their homes. Um, tents and trailers located anywhere are fine if that's the frame of what you're asking. However, we have learned that once displaced, communities rarely reform, and temporary housing often becomes permanent, and sometimes can go for generations, whether we're looking at refugee housing, whether we're looking at disasters um, that force a community to flee. So what if we shift our question, as BC Workshop did, and ask instead, how new shelter can also receive the rebuilding of a community. The set of acceptable solutions become quite different. And today with this project, we'll see how reframing that question not only shifted the design options um, of such homes, but it also generates other questions. How would this be financed? What if anything can be done ahead of time? Who should be involved? What political hurdles must be up cleared in advance? And on and on and on. And so in our school of architecture, planning, preservation, and real estate development, this project goes to all of those disciplines and helps us see how they're really intertwined if we really want to tackle such a question. So as you listen and learn today, keep in mind this other lesson, that how we frame our questions is equally important for us to apply in our research practice and scholarship to test that we're actually putting our efforts into working on the right solution and the right problem. Today, as I mentioned, we're joined by Omar Hakim. Um, he is the design director at Building Community Workshop and the co-designer of the Rapido Housing Project. Um, Omar is working to build an organizational-wide design practice he is based in Washington, D.C., 
working to bring greater social and environmental equality through thoughtful design and planning. From 2013 to 2015, Omar led the Rio Grande Valley office, focusing on a geographical, social, cultural frontier by addressing the systemic poverty, health, and resilience issues that plagued that region. Through these efforts, he has completed award-winning affordable housing, rapid response disaster housing prototypes, urban bike and pedestrian infrastructure, regional drainage improvements, and community-based rural planning initiatives. Omar's passion for design has taken him from the cloud forest of Costa Rica to the ravaged communities of the Gulf Coast and many places in between. His professional practice has also included supporting large arts and cultural projects at Skidmore, Owens, and Merrill, D.C., and prefabricated modular buildings at Alchemy Architects in Minnesota. Originally from Washington, D.C., he received his Bachelor of Science of Architecture from SUNY Buffalo, as well as a Master of Architecture and a Master of Science in Sustainable Design from the University of Minnesota in 2009. And I'd like to invite everybody, following the lecture, we put up a pop-up exhibit um, on the bridge of this project. So we're going to have an opening up there and a little reception. So I'd like everybody to join us there. And now I'd like to uh, please join me in welcoming Omar Hakim, who will deliver the lecture, Rapid Recovering Housing, Designing a New System for Disaster Reconstruction. Here we go. That's better? Great. All right. I'm going to warn everybody. There are some slides with words on them. I know that's no. like really painful for architects, but brace yourselves. Um, thank you, Rudy. I think that was a really excellent introduction to how we thought about this um, Rapido initiative and how we've had to approach it in a little different way. It definitely kind of stretched, stretched us, made us think differently about it, and um, and I hope we came up with a more holistic solution. I'll just introduce uh, my organization, the Link Community Workshop. We're a nonprofit design firm. Um, what does that really mean? Um, probably not that different from most architectural practices. That's the joke, right? So um, you'll find out about that soon. <laughs> um, we, uh, we have four offices, one in DC here, one in Houston, Texas, one in Brownsville, Texas, on the border of Mexico and the United States, and one in Dallas, Texas, where we got started. Um, we do all of the types of things that most architectural practices do, like we you know, design projects, do construction documents, deliver them, um, do construction administration, all of that kind of stuff um, that a traditional practice would do. Um, however, we as a mission-based organization have some other specific goals that we kind of add on to that or, or at least hold ourselves accountable to. One of those is, is really trying to build capacity through design. And the way that manifests is the types of organizations that we work with um, are not always the kind of high capacity, you know, organized development organizations, um, hospitality uh, groups, um, or high-end residential clients who have often worked with designers who have been asked to, um, you know, go through an architectural process. So we try, in the work that we do, build capacity, right? So, you know, if we're working with a housing authority, it, everyone kind of, there's a general, I mean, it's not with all housing authorities, but many housing authorities are very underfunded. Public housing is kind of at risk right now in our country, and housing authorities um, are having a hard go. They're very understaffed. We still work with a lot of housing authorities, and we have to try and bring a slightly different skill set and a set of um, you know, additional kind of um, practice methods to try and support their work and expand their work and also do what they do, you know, we like to think a little bit better. Um, I added action uh, through making and craft because I think it's important that we, when we run up against an issue that we might not be able to solve in the most traditional process through a kind of client delivered model or through a, you know, in, in a process where someone kind of gets us set up, gets ready to pay us, we do some work, they pay us for it, then they go build something. Sometimes we just go do stuff. 
and that's 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 kind of our self-initiated work. Um, but I also think it gives you know it it, it it enables us to work with scenarios and places that we otherwise wouldn't be able to. This is kind of the frame of a mobile fabrication lab that we built for the DC Public Library. Otherwise, I don't think this would have really happened, and those types of services would not be in the types of neighborhoods that they are that they're in. Um, and it gives back to us, right? You all are learning this, I assume, now um, in school or in practice. Um, we we get back from from our making, right? We experiment. We we see what steel and wood does, how those materials react, how joints and and um, assemblies come together, and that you know obviously informs our work going forward. So um, the reason I say that also is that I think in the in the general frame of public interest design, I think we talk a lot about kind of specifically who we're working with or the process of community engagement, but I don't want to strike out the fact that we spend a lot of time making things and doing things, and I think that's where we really start to see change in people's lives. You know, that's that's when that's our goal, right? Everybody, our collective goal, um, and we try and amplify the voices of the people that we work with in everything that we do. I mean, we need to be able to um, expand upon, but not, but not kind of speak for, right? That's, that's the intentional way that we're working. So if there's an issue, how do we open that up and support that community and build power within that community to try and reverse some of the structural issues that have kept things the way that they are? So this is an image of Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens. Has anyone ever been? This is a little props for Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens in DC, right? I, do you, does anyone remember the entryway to that space? It's quite, it's, it's a little rough. It's got a big chain link fence with a razor wire top. There's a large, um, yeah, there's a large uh, maintenance shed with a, red, a threadbare blue tarp on it. And it's really, truly really threadbare. And, a, and, and, and the sign is kind of falling over. There aren't really any signs. And it faces out to the first uh, public housing project that was, per that was purchased by the tenants who organized and, and uh, created a cooperative and then purchased through TOPO, Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act. So it's an amazing um, kind of historical space around it. And the way it faces out, out to that space is, is pretty, you know, unfortunate. And the way, once you get into the kennel with the crowd gardens, there's cypress and lilies and all that stuff, it's gorgeous. But that, that, that the situation of those neighbors and, 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 and that community, um, the situation of the aquatic gardens, in doing the work, we're trying to amplify um, what, they, what, they, what they want for their, for their place, what they're advocating for their place. So that, just a few ways that we work. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about disaster recovery housing, right? So Rapido is a holistic approach that enables communities to recover from disasters within months instead of years and at a fraction of the cost. So um, this is what a lot of people, this is the living condition of many people um, in the country, I'll say, right? We have to kind of remember that we're in one of the wealthiest parts of the country. Um, this is an image across the um, near the, the Texas Gulf Coast, and when um, disasters hit, communities like this are already at a very high risk. And a lot of this, a lot of the work being done in disaster recovery um, is recognizing that. But I think we need to go a little further, and I'll, I'll kind of come back to this. Um, I'll come back to this more. So. Um, a few things, especially in the disaster recovery community, but I think in our in our world nationally, that we can all agree on. Rebuilding takes too long. People are in, out of their homes for years. When you're out of your neighborhood, when you're out of your place, when you're gone for that long, the fabric that weaves, the threads that weave a community together and build that strong communal fabric, they start to unravel. If you leave and you don't see your friends and your family for years, that changes a place, right? There's a lot of talk about what is resilience, right? Part of resilience is like, let's make sure that this house doesn't flood, but part of it is also how do we support the systems of support that hold communities together. 
it costs too much. The issue with it costing too much is kind of obvious. You know, no, we don't want to spend that much of our taxpayer money on on a on a reduced outcome, but also because it costs so much, we're helping fewer people. And and that's a problem. So we need to reduce the cost and we need to help more people. It's pretty straightforward. And then we repeat the same mistakes over and over and over again. We Part of that is because we're using the same solution. And the other part of it is that we're not really intentionally learning from the past in, in our response. After every major disaster, the last major, kind of, we'll say six or seven, there has been a large civil rights based lawsuit against the government, usually states, because states are the one that administer disaster recovery funding based on, you know, um, uh, an inequitable allocation of funding usually. So in Sandy, they weren't doing bilingual translation for recovery services after the storm. And a lot of the renters that were living in the damaged areas were not English as first language speakers. And so those people were very missed, right? And if we're putting our services out as a government, we have to make sure that we're we're, we're kind of hitting everyone pro, um, you know, cross section e equitably. That's that's what the Fair Housing Act is for, and and that was kind of a ding on this. And um, similar things have happened in other storms. In this image that I mentioned here, um, there's an issue called deferred maintenance, where a, where a, a, an evaluator of damage, a damage assessor, will go out to a, a home that's been damaged in a storm and will say, well. Your house, uh, you didn't take care of your house well enough beforehand, so you're not actually eligible for that much money. Um, it's a hard story for me to tell, but a woman that we met, that we were working with, was living um, in a trailer with her family. Um, she had two kids, she was single mom, and her trailer was damaged. Um, but when it was assessed, they, because of deferred maintenance, which is hard, right? Because if you don't have a lot of money, you can't spend a lot of money maintaining your home. That's called, you know, being poor. It's the way it works. There's, it's, it, 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 there's just, it's impossible to make that, to make that happen all the time. Well, this woman lost her home. They evaluated that there were some issues with the structure beforehand. She, 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 she had her, her kids, she had what she could fit in her car, and she had $400 for her know, That was it. So that's kind of what deferred maintenance does, and that's why it's a problem that keeps modest families very modest, and you know, kind of get into that. This is kind of one of those obvious graphs. We spent a lot of money on disasters. In 2018, we spent 160 billion dollars on disasters. A lot of that was related, and this is kind of the makeup of those disasters, just so you all know. Green being meteorological, um, climatological, hydrological, geophysical, and we also, um, yeah, so that's just kind of the makeup of disasters. But the main important thing is that we're spending a lot of money. I think it was 25 billion dollars in damages from the campfires, for example, um, in California, um, 2017. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the pieces of this Rapido um, initiative. The housing model, so right, that's the, that's the kind of what we would call the quote unquote architecture, right? So that's, that's the kind of house widget, a designy thing. This is a system, we did a system guide as well, and we did a policy guide, and I'm going to tell you why. But Radit's introduction was perfect in that we, we, we can design, like, there's all kinds of really cool disaster recovery widget things that, you know, some come under helicopters and some are geodesic domes and some are egg-shaped things that gravitate out onto a field or something. But none of them, or not many of them, are really addressing the system in which they're deployed. That's, that's part of this, right? So how do we actually, we, we design something, and you can think about this kind of going from macro to micro or micro to macro, but if you're going to design something, what system is that worth working within? And then what rules does it break or not break? Going from the other way, we 
we have this whole big system, right? How is our federal system, how are the laws that are set in place, how do they, how do they kind of create parameters for disaster recovery housing? How do they then set up systems that either work or don't work? And then how do those systems inform the design? But we decided we had to do all of that. We had to actually design something. We had to figure out a new system for it to be deployed because otherwise it would make no difference. And we had to actually change some laws. And otherwise this wouldn't work at all. So we're going to talk about architecture first. Don't worry. Um, this is a little blurry, but this is what happens to FEMA trailers when families move out of them. We park them in a field. Um, many of them are in the south, and we let them run. So here's how disaster recovery happens generally. We um, disaster is declared, right? Or uh, I should say, a disaster happens, right? So a hurricane hits um, an area, a set of tornadoes hits an area, an earthquake happens, a fire happens. And then the government says, okay, this is a disaster. FEMA can come, Federal Emergency Management Agency, they can come and start spending money, right? They can say, okay, right away, we're gonna get people into shelters, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that, um, we're gonna deliver water, we're going to provide medical services, we can start some case management stuff. Um, and then they can bring in temporary housing, but the key word is temporary, it has to be temporary per the Stafford Act, which is a federal law. We can't do anything permanent with FEMA money. Then, that kind of happens for a while, right? A year, or two, and then there's a shift to where HUD can start to spend money. But the, the thing about that shift is that it requires a municipality, or whoever's been kind of declared a natural, natural disaster area, to create an action plan. So storm hits, FEMA can come help for a while, but you then need to create an, an action plan, and that action plan needs to be approved by HUD. Has anyone ever done any like state or federal based planning before? Does it move quickly? No, it moves very, very, very slowly. We're talking about years. They still have not allocated money for Hurricane Harvey in Houston, for example. They haven't even released an RFP for communities to respond, for organizations to respond and start building. They haven't, they haven't even really started the outward facing procurement process. And that happened in 2017. So we're, we're a little ways out. Like we're coming into 2020, right? And, and, and we still haven't really started spending the big money as part of HUD's Community Development Block Grant Program. And I know this is kind of a lot of policy stuff, and I definitely was not thinking too much about this when I was in school, but it, it, it's surprisingly important. And the reason is, because it takes so long, people live in FEMA trailers and manufactured housing units for a really long time. If you're an elderly family and your home is damaged, you're given, and you're given a FEMA trailer, what are you going to do? You're going to put all of your worldly possessions in it, right? Elderly people are going to have a hard time moving those boxes around and cleaning stuff and reorganizing. It's like, it's really small, right? You guys have been in a small RV before or seen a small RV. They're small. If you live in one of those for five years and you're an elderly person, that is not good for your health. I mean, that is a hard situation to be in. People's life expectancies go down. People have um, the indoor, indoor air quality in these kinds of spaces is really low. They're using a lot of formaldehyde-based adhesives. The waterproofing is bad. There's a lot of moisture penetration, mold, um, pests. Um, it's not a good situation. So we spend a lot of money, anywhere between seventy-five and one hundred thirty-two thousand dollars right now, to get a FEMA trailer or a mobile a manufactured housing unit onto a site. People live in it for a while, too long. And then, and then once eventually we get them out, once that kind of HUD money can come in, we put them in a field and let them rot. And we also pay for that. Now all that money is gone. One hundred thirty-two thousand dollars is gone, and then we have to come back and do some more funding to put people back in their homes. So you'll see on that model, there's kind of two tracks. One is the the old track, the kind of the way that we we have been doing it, which is do FEMA let those rot, put them in a 
field to kind of fall apart, and then and meet you with the ground and all that stuff. Um, and then we pay for about, you know, it's really hard to put to a specific number, but around $250,000 after that to get someone back in their home. So we're around $380,000. In a rural area, $380,000, you can almost build three houses for that. I mean, you're, you can easily be in the like $90,000, $110,000 for a small, you know, three bedroom home in a rural area. So we're proposing something different. We're proposing a temporary to permanent solution. All this stuff is like really straightforward. This, this, working on this as a designer, as someone that's excited about architecture and building and fabrication, all that is like kind of hard because we wanted to do something really cool, really interesting, really innovative, something that used um, new materials and was kind of aesthetically and tectonically interesting. And what we realized is that we have to keep this really, really simple. So we said, what's something that we can build that's small, that can be temporary, the temporary part, and then just make it so it's transferable so that it can be expanded on to become a permanent part so we're not building the same thing twice. I mean, that's not anything really that's really like super complicated or innovative in my opinion. It's just the hard part actually is the keeping the simple part. So how do we do that? We build we're kind of proposing a simple panelized system, two by fours, plywood, zip wall, that kind of stuff. Everything. Have you guys seen um, Apollo 13? Is that like too old a movie? No. Yeah. Okay. You know when the, the guys their, their air is running out and they have to build an air filter out of like a plastic bag and build that tape. You remember that? So that's kind of what this was for us, right? We had to go. What can you get in a lumber yard that would be that, that we could actually build these panels out of that was really, really simple. So they're wood frame panels because, you know, that's what many carpenters work with, so they're easy to expand. They're all small enough that we can kind of, we kind of have the weight of each one. You know, a couple people can pick them up. Um, we consolidated the wet wall and electrical systems into one wall so the inspectors can see that, and that's, that's all done. It's all hurricane, um, kind of windstorm, up to 140 mile an hour design. So that all, that's all covered. And then um, these panels can be built off-site, stored in a um, construction, you know, construction yard, a, a lumber yard. You know, a lot of those places are also supplied by trains. So easy to, um, to get materials in and out because oftentimes highway infrastructure um, is out of, out of the question um, right after a storm. And then stood up by really, really, um, Kind of straightforward crews. We're talking about two people. We call this the two people in a truck approach, right? So it's two, it was in this case two guys, their pickup truck, and a plumber and electrician. And they were building panels for one unit in about three days and standing them up in about another two or three days. So that's the idea. Stack them up, store them away. When the storm hits, put them out, get people rehoused pretty quickly. Um, and in a scenario that they can live in for a while, but because we've kind of designed the whole system, we're saying this is a part of a process that also will secure people getting back into a more permanent, larger kind of living condition, living situation sooner. So really simple again, a little kind of box thing with a porch, and then again, it's designed to be expanded upon, and then that's kind of the process of expansion, right? Pretty straightforward, wood frame construction, this little living space, um, kitchen area, bedroom becomes a bedroom, bathroom, bedroom, and then mo in most of the configurations, that's you know kind of a living space, maybe an additional bedroom. We work in the places that we work. We kind of set up a kind of catalog or design language that we're working with to make sure that the homes that are being expanded upon are contextual because we're not saying that okay, okay, we've got six, seven options in this place, and that's just going to work for the whole country. The, the point would be to be working with local communities say, what do these kind of expansions look like? We've kind of engineered this widget pretty well, but, but the expansions could be a whole number of different options uh, as long as they work with that, that scenario, that, that kind of core, as we call it. There's an interior shop, pretty simple. It's kind of plywood cabinetry here. All of this, when this moves, when this is gone, before this is installed, the plumbing wall, the, and we're using PEX, 
which is a kind of flexible plumbing system that connects to a manifold, so the whole plumbing system can be kind of done, and then you connect it on site, and these again are all techniques that many, many contractors use locally. This is done with by Home Depot, and, um, and inspectors can inspect it once it's on site, because the reason I'm stressing that is because doing manufactured housing and doing off-site inspections is actually a big deal. It's really hard. You have to have um, your buildings engineered, and that costs many thousands of dollars. And you have to actually, in some cases, fly inspectors out to where these built are being built. And you're not really supporting local economies as much if you're doing it all off-site, right? So figuring out how to do it in a way that allows kind of a local process to happen and not have to rewrite as many of those rules was, was really important to us. So a little bit of just kind of the flow of that system. Um, so you've got off-site construction. At the same time, you're doing on-site construction and clearing of those lots, right? Building foundations, clearing the lots. They're all really simple, peer-based peer -based, peer, um, based foundations. And then there's also, at the same time, these outreach teams that are being dispatched. And the important part about that is that the case management and outreach process is actually really the heart of disaster recovery. Getting people through that system is actually is pretty complicated, and so you need to start that. Um, you need to start that before or at the same time that you're doing all these other processes. The way we're doing it right now, where we just do it sequentially, and actually, because again, remember, in most disaster scenarios, we haven't actually planned officially planned for that disaster yet. So a disaster hits, remember, we are then planning for how to respond. If, if you're in Houston, I mean, you know that this is going to happen again. If you're on the, you know, Florida coast, you know this is going to happen again. If you live in California, you know that this is going to happen again. And yet, our governmental process does not allow for kind of, I guess, um, what's the right word? Preemptive. Yeah, well, preemptive but sanctioned planning, right? I mean, communities can plan, but it doesn't actually become part of the process for allocating the funding. And so all of this stuff has to happen afterward, which a lot of it could be happening before, right? So um, are we doing environmental clearances and assessments, right? We kind of already know where the highest risk places are. All of that could happen beforehand. Could we procure all of the builders before a storm so that they know when a storm happens they have a job, that they're actually going to stay rather than leave to go find work. I mean, can we set up networks of community organizers, um, bilingual uh, or trilingual or, you know, what is it, um, outreach workers, assessment teams, can we set all of that up ahead of time? Obviously the answer is we should be doing it, but we're not. That's not what's happening out there, just so you all know. And all of these processes stack up and make the process of recovery take years rather than months. So again, so we're getting families set up, we're working on their site, we're prefabricating all at the same time. People are able, able to move into their home. Um, the case management process continues for the expansion, right? Because you have to continue, switch to HUD, get community development block grants set up and do the expansion. So they're kind of continually working through the case management process, but they're living back in their neighborhood. That's the important part. And then how does that kind of influence a place, right? If we're working in a grassroots way, and you know, designing a system that, that people can stand up on their own, that families, aunts, uncles, you know, can, can work on together, can we start to rebuild communities faster and get people to get back back in their neighborhood? Okay, there's going to be some words on these slides. Uh, so let's just talk about, again, the big system, right? So they, we, we're trying to develop a system that supports, where the aid actually supports local communities more than larger kind of regional, and this is a you know, diagram of Texas because this is what our first pilot was. But, for example, the, the contractors that are normally responding to this are like AECOM, ICF. I mean, they're in Fairfax, they're in, you know, Los Angeles. They're, they're not, they're large multinational engineers.
engineering firms, conglomerates that are responding to that. And the responses, you know, they're building, um, you know, RVs in Wisconsin and shipping them down, which is all good, right? I'm glad that people there, but when you have an economy that's so damaged after a storm, we should be trying to support local responses as much as possible so that that aid can really be, you know, um, supporting those local families. We're trying to take decision making, and this is um, kind of a, I'm going to talk about politics for a second, but this type of thing is, is usually a hard thing to do in a bipartisan way, right? Because it, it sounds a lot like a social welfare type program. Right? Like, oh, let's spend more money on modest people, right? And a lot of conservative lawmakers have trouble with that. So if you, if you propose a system that actually takes and says we're going to do local and regional control, that's a more bipartisan response. And, and I think it works better because local communities, because trying to say blanket level, this is how all disaster recovery policy and process should be happening, set down by FEMA, that doesn't always work that well because there's different scenarios, different, different systems to support those policies in different places. Um, and by changing that decision-making process, we hope that, you know, it just takes less time. Um, all right, so here we go kind of into the system, right? So we said, okay, here's a different process for rebuilding. How are we going to get that done? So we said, let's, let's actually just write out the structure that needs to happen to make this work. And, and, and part of what I'm, I'll just be obvious about what I'm, what I'm proposing here generally is that this is design, right? This is still design. This still takes designers to think about this stuff. And I'm hoping that, well, I'll skip that, but it's important. And it's important for, for creative problem solvers like you all to be out thinking about this stuff and working on this stuff. Because we had these meetings, right, before this stuff came out. And we had, I'm not, I don't have a background in policy. I don't have a background in like system design or um, kind of processes related to, um, you know, bureaucratic organizations. But, but we, it took the designers to come up and think about how this whole system would work together. So we're basically saying, okay, here's all the people in play, and then we, we created a guide, right? One of the groups that we worked with said, these pictures, these designs, these prototypes are really cool, but we need something for the box checkers. I hate to be kind of uh, blunt about it, but a lot of people that work in disaster recovery, a lot of the, 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 the people that feed that machine and that make that work, they work in a very systematic way, and they need to know specifically what you're asking them to do, at what time, and who do they need to talk to to make sure that's approved to move that along to the next step. So we said, okay, here's our kind of system of people, here's all the roles, and then we wrote this really extensive guide, like a step-by-step -step guidebook on how to make that happen. When each person has a role, you have, they, it says where you need to talk to the next person, how this is all going to kind of lay out, right? So this is us redesigning the system of disaster recovery through the people that are that are implementing it. And taking what, again, would normally be like way, way out here, and how do we compress it, right? I know this is one of those like, silly things to show on a, in a slide, like, you know, we'll read this, and it just looks like a bunch of crazy lines, right? But, but we did actually say, okay, what are all the things that need to happen, and how can we more or less kind of stack things up in that other, like you saw that kind of other system based diagram that stack those up. How do we overlap things? How do we do things like before a storm to try and shorten this process? And how do we get tag all of the people that are part of that to understand where they so if we say, okay, FEMA, you can buy these Rapido core units from us, which they've asked us to do, if you look at this. But you can't just try and, you're not going to fix it by this new thing. You really need to think about the system. And so we actually had to back off and say, okay, look, it's about a whole system. And designing that process kind of goes all the way through it. So um, that's kind of what the technical guide, or what our kind of our, our policy or, or recommendations are made up of. So, you know, the introduction.
technical guide, that whole process that goes through and says it supports the policy recommendations, it creates an administrative structure, it links it back to the building process itself, and it's, it kind of creates a step-by-step -step process for the case managers to make the whole system work together. And then we went into some policy recommendations, and policy recommendations are basically recommendations for lawmakers to change laws. Um, and then we also did a bunch of studies. So there's, this is a lot of stuff, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go really, really deep on this because it's too hard to read, and it's too, it's, it's Friday, and it's five o'clock. Um, so um, we created a bunch of broad-based policy recommendations. When we started doing this stuff, people started to get a little bit interested. We had lawmakers saying, "Well, why aren't we doing this, right? For my community, if you're a local congressman." Or, a local, or like a state senator, for example, they see this stuff, I go, oh, wait, wait, why aren't we doing this? Because people come to my office and they're very upset. They're, they're, their tío and their tía you know, are out of their homes. They've got cousins, they've got family, they've got mothers and daughters that are not being housed in, in, in kind of safe you know, human conditions. And they, they, want to, they want to change that. So we're saying, OK, cool. We can do that. Here's some broad recommendations. Here's some specific recommendations related to outreach and public participation, case management and social services, and design and construction. And that all together is setting up a process for pre-disaster preparedness. Again, when I was when I was kind of in your chairs, I was thinking about design in this really specific way of like. I'm going to be this great architect, I'm going to do all this stuff. And when we started this process as architects, we were only th we were thinking about a housing model and how to do that. Oh, how many, can we build more like shelving into it, storage? Maybe the wall could be all shelving in this kind of manufactured system built with CNC routers. And it was like, we were like just nerding out on all that stuff. And then we realized none of that matters at all unless you fix the rules that are, that, that are setting up that process. And, and, and once those rules are fixed, you need a better solution. So, so we do need to design something, but we really should be thinking about it holistically. That's my point. So I'm just going to do this a little, like I'm just going to go through some of this stuff just to say, just to throw out there that these things are important, and they're important for designers to think about. So forgive me. Encourage and support the development and maintenance of data that supports fact-based planning, right? So we have to actually set up processes for data collection that are fact-based and that don't rely on people going, nah, you know, that area that just doesn't flood. You know, that's not an area that floods. That's kind of what happens sometimes, believe it or not. A local county commission will say, well, let's not worry about that area. And that sets out a precedent that we don't actually have to do specific data in the research. Um, let's see, I'm going to pick out a couple more. Um, streamlining and enhancing communication systems used by case managers. Most of the time, case managers are working on totally different databases throughout a community. So this person has a list, and they're like, Oh, all of these addresses and all these families are needing this. And then another organization has a different list, and they're working off that. And some of the people are on the same list, and they're also missing some of the people off the other list. And then another organization, and another, and another. We're talking about in some places, like in Houston, you have people around the table. There's 25, 30 organizations around the table, and they're all working off of different databases to try and help the same people. You can imagine how that's a little bit problematic, right? I mean. It's good that there's that network surrounding it, but it's also problematic in that we're not really being kind of, we're not leveraging the specific skill sets of these different organizations. Because some might be kind of a muck and gut, get your house cleaned out, get it, get it, get it kind of ready for, for rebuilding. Some of it might be um, clinical services for young women, and they're not really overlapping and using their resources collectively. So that, that's the kind of stuff. So, um, we said the, the big one of the big ones here was that we need to rethink the Stafford Act and say that temporary housing, if it's under the temporary allocation, it can be expanded upon 
and built through community development, um, community development block, block grants for disaster recovery, CDGDR. So that was one of the big ones. Um, the state. Well, can you explain that? Because I don't think that made it clear, right? Okay. So that the money is separate. Is right. Separate. And you had to move from the trio to the. Yeah, so yeah, so just re reiterate that when FEMA funds something, they can only fund something temporary. And in their narrow definition, that means it needs to have a chassis and an axle. It actually says that. So a chassis and an axle. And if they pay for that, and let's say it was a really cool wood frame structure that is not made of metal and thin kind of masonite and other kind of types of wall sections that, that uh, manufactured housing or that uh, travel trailer was made out of. And, but you got this really nice structure you've designed and it's on a chassis and trailer to be delivered. Because it was paid for by FEMA, that cannot be used in any way by HUD. So we have to throw that away. And then we have to expand on it with a whole, we have, sorry, we have to build something else, totally different, a whole other set, a whole other pot of money. So again, we're building a house for someone, throw it away, and then we're building another house because of an outdated, an outdated law that's trying to keep governmental agencies and the funding for those agencies separate. Is that, is that clear? Okay. So that was one of the major issues, is that community development block grant should be able to, so we are working with legislatures right now to try and create laws to, to make this allowable. Um, this, another one, states should use qualified state universities to provide technical assistance. That's basically saying a state, officially, because it's a state, and it's also a state entity, a university, should be able to plan ahead of the storm and get some of the stuff rolling. Um, housing recovery programs should increase housing choice for vulnerable populations, permitting relocation to less exposed locations and or structural improvements to homes that will withstand future disasters. So we should be building in better places and we need to be building back in a, in a, in a, like, in a way that, that's less prone to a future disaster. Again, that makes sense, right? That's like common sense, but this stuff is not in it because if you're living in a trailer, you're not, those trailers are not anchored down very well. And a storm, I mean, have you ever seen a trailer park after a hurricane, they are, they're usually, it's a, you know, it's a sad scene because people's homes are strewn all over the place because they're not anchored down and embedded in the ground with like a pier, a concrete pier, or with a large, heavy, you know, slab of grain foundation. And we, should, we just need to put this stuff into law. It, it, it's strange to me because it, it makes, it seems common sense. But anyway, um, so, County and on a local level, county should seek and accept more control over land use, building codes in high hazard areas to reduce exposure and vulnerability and losses to life and property. A lot of counties don't have building codes. And so they're saying, well, we can't really say what people can and can't do. But when storms happen, people are still out of their homes. People still need to be, be supported, right? So that money still has to come in and help those people out. But states aren't advocating to be proactive about it. Sorry, local areas are not being proactive about advocating for disaster recovery kind of uh, based code solutions like certain amount of uplift for the structure, right? Or different kinds of, um, you know, basically armoring for the building so that, um, you know, two by four doesn't fly too soon as we go. So I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of what we've been up to since we kind of kicked off this initiative and it, you know, in 2014, 2015, where we've been up to recently, I guess I should say. So in Houston, this, the issue that we had, and we had done this in the Rio Grande Valley first, we were working away, and then Harvey gets. In, in Houston, the issue that we've had is that homes were flooded. They weren't kind of wiped off, like in some places, like in, in, in the Mississippi Gulf Coast or, or other kind of high wind areas. So when a home is flooded, it gets really wet, and then it dries, back out very slowly usually because of insulation, because of sheetrock, and because the process takes a long time. A lot of um, a lot of black mold sets in. Black mold, as soon as black mold hits, 
you're done. It's very hard to remediate the house. But we still have a lot of buildings in Houston that are potentially recoverable. We're going to see. It depends on how long this takes. And so what we're proposing is a, a kind of accessory level model to, just to be really straightforward about it. Because we're hoping that once that, that transference happens, once those homes are able to be repaired, that we're building an affordable housing, an affordable rental stock within existing neighborhoods, because that's a major issue. Um, you know, people, you know, local organizations like a Habitat for Humanity that builds, you know, apartments and, and sometimes rents them out. Um, they're like, well, why? What are we going to do about the rental situation? Well, could a disaster recovery uh, response be? something that can get people back into their homes, but then it's legacy, rather than being expanded upon, because there's nowhere to put it, and um, build up the rest of the home next to it if there's still already a home on that lot. Could the legacy of it actually be that it's a, it's a rental unit, it's a unit for um, kind of aging in place families, you know, if, a, if a, an in-law or a, you know, an elderly person you know, with you, or a rental unit, or even just a sanctuary, kind of a high, an elevated um, structure that's on your lot that you can live in, in this scenario where your home floods again, because a lot of these homes were built side upgrade, which means they're low now. So we built a couple of kind of other kind of tests, small kind of prototype type units that are, that, are, that are designed to be expanded upon. One that was expanded upon, in this case, the core kind of unit was right here. And then we were added on to we added on to the rest of it right there. Um, we were working with a prefabricated like a modular manufacturer to try that process out because after Amelda, right? So we had Harvey, and then I don't know if you guys heard too much about it. It wasn't covered that much in the news, but Houston this last um, couple months ago, I think in September was end August September was was really really badly flooded, especially in the areas outside. Houston, kind of north of Houston, um, north uh, east of Houston, and so TEMA, Texas Emergency Management Agency, is saying, okay, well, we could potentially let's see if we can try out this temporary and permanent solution. So we're working with some prefabricated housing manufacturers to build modular units to test out that as a price. We're building some of the others um, on site right now using panelized construction and local labor, small labor crews. Um, We've set up a kind of process, a few different design options for those accessory dwelling units. Okay. Um, you know, one that's kind of be able to fit alongside the house, kind of porch to the front. You can see some of the drawings there for that. Um, we've got a kind of unit with the four. Okay. Great. So, um, yeah. Again, just really simple porch, kind of on the front facing. Facing the lot, uh, you can kind of see here again. It's that little bathroom core area, a simple kind of kitchen living space with a couch that's convertible to a bed, and then another bedroom. Like very simple, right? I mean, the, the, it was again. It's hard to kind of, but we had to figure out what could you basically flat pack. What could really, really modest construction, really kind of basic construction crews do? Uh, different type of layout with the Kind of wrap around porch. We were, we we're emphasizing outdoor space on all of this because when you're living in a really small unit, um, having a little bit of outdoor space is nice. These we're targeting for about thirty, thirty-five thousand dollars each. That's what we've been building them at. Um, this, this, this unit here, um, and the idea is that. Um, we're building for about this, plus what it costs to expand it, costs not much more. Obviously, it will cost a little more because it's two processes. You know, builders take the cost of the money to start something and then to come back and start again. That's called mobilization. But the idea is that, let's say we spend $30,000, $35,000 on this, that we can expand upon it for sixty dollars to $70,000 and get someone back in a home for $110,000, $120,000, $130,000 which is how much a manufactured housing unit would cost in the first place. We're just setting that benchmark because we need to be strong in how we respond and say, look, FEMA, look HUD, you can get people back in their homes 
all the way in a secure, beautiful, bright place that's got good air that, that, that is designed for your family for the same cost that it, would, that it would take to just put a manufactured housing unit on their site and then wait for it to rot and then put it in a farm field, let it rot further. You know, that's that's the goal. That's the kind of hey, you know, finger gesture, government. <laughs> This is what we should be doing. So, what happened though? That's, that's it. Um, we need to be doing this, we need to be doing it quickly, and we need to be advocating it for our places um, when disaster strikes. 530. Good job. We have time for questions. And I should also just say that Omar just showed a teeny, teeny, teeny piece of all of their beautiful work. So I encourage you to go to their website to see more questions. Hi, I was wondering, um, what was FEMA's response to your requirement that you use your, you use your system? They're just basically... Versus just finding it. I said, well, well, let's talk about it. We kind of went back and forth through the contractual process a little bit. But they were, they were saying, you know, we need a thousand of these tomorrow. I'm like, okay, we do that, but we've already, it's like, hey, don't you all realize we're doing the same thing we do over and over and over again? We just wait until it gets really bad, until a storm happens. Then you usually wait a little longer, then respond. And so it's really hard to work and try something different in that type of scenario. So it's not often successful for us, so we just kind of say, thank you, we'd love to, just, we'd love to start working on your future disaster recovery needs. We're working with some FEMA groups now, but kind of in that planning phase, actually, you know, because we're outside of the context of the storm. Not to, like, as a weird cult, but I
data, we have technologies that can map the surface of the ground up to a, the you know, increment of a foot, right? So even though we do have outdated FEMA floodplain maps, we can we know we have hydrological modeling, we have you know other incremental, not as you know disastrous as harbor, but we have other incremental storms that happen on a regular basis. We know where it's gonna flood, we know where high risk areas are, and we know what is the general process that would have to get set out. Like for example, procurement is such a boring thing to talk about, but procurement is important in that it it takes a long time for governments to hire people. If you're just going to say, we're going to have a planning firm procured ahead of time, so we're going to have it, boom, it can start. That's a simple step. It doesn't matter if it's a flood or if it's here or there. They can start. So I'm not saying do it without the money, but let's just put the money sooner in the process. Any other questions? Can you talk about um, how your firm is paid for this work? Sure. Now I'm going to, this blue is kind of cool. much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, okay. yeah, that's nice. Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, sure, so in this case, this was a little bit unique, but um, we're somewhere between, we get some money through um, what we call contributed income, which is mostly grants, and those grants are specifically project-based. We don't have any big, um, donors to just give us money to just be there, right? To, um, so we get grants, and we also get, we get kind of paid for some of the work that we do, kind of fee for service. So you guys, you need something, you're a community development corporation, you're a nonprofit that's looking for you, headquarters building, you're an environmental education center, something mission aligned, they need some design work done, we get paid. Um, in this case, again, we keep making the same mistake. Houston got dinged, the state got dinged by a civil rights based advocacy law firm. And they said, you're not, you're not allocating money equitably, you need to redo it. And if you don't, we're going to sue you using the Fair Housing Act. So the government said, okay, let's create a reconciliation agreement and let's set in place a few million dollars to go back and create a pilot process that would potentially reinvent the disaster recovery scenario. And that's how we this happened. A lawsuit. So it's good to have partners that have other skill sets outside of creative problem solving or creative in, in other ways outside of design. Um, but it is an important lesson to have partners that are looking at the same types of challenges but in different ways with different tools. Sure. Um, are there any other countries or models that you looked at in developing this system for some amount of pre-planning for disaster recovery? Because there's, with climate change, there are disasters happening all over the place, and it seems like the MO is, oh no, let's stick people in places, oh no, the housing, uh, the story you told mm -hmm. is a common story yeah. in a lot of places. So. Are there any places where they're doing this in a better way already? Um, yes, there are. We did a ton of research on different types of construction types, different kind of um, you know, recovery units, different. In many cases, like this is kind of obvious, but Europe is a lot further along, but they also have a governmental system that puts a lot more money into this this type of process, and they also spend a lot more on their infrastructure. Um, like in the Netherlands, they are, they have a whole system set up for flood mitigation, and they have local, like local townships have very specific and community adopted processes right after, you know, a flood would happen to help, you know, the process move along. We, we're kind of a, you know, don't tell me how to do yeah. it. <laughs> let's, let's, you know, I'll figure it out. So, but yeah, we'll do that. Any other questions? Sure. Um, you talked a lot about uh, writing different policy recommendations. So you talked a lot about writing different policy recommendations for just the public sector in general. Have like adhered to your guidance um, 
more so than others. To be honest with you, um, so states have really recognized that the way that CDBGDR and the theme of funding being separated, they recognize that that's a big problem. And that's where like TEMA, Texas Emergency Management, so the state agency of FEMA for Texas, you know, approaches and said, look, Amelda, this is a chance to kind of try out a different process. They're usually at the level that's been the most responsive, but they're also the level that is responsible for administering funds. The federal government gives it to the state and the state puts it out. So they're the ones that have to deal with it the most. I think that local municipalities feel the, the hurt the most, right? They're like, it's my community, my place. <coughs> a county judge sees their community when they drive through, but they don't have the power to change it like the state does. And um, my question's a little bit, um, well, I have two questions actually. And um, the first one sort of speaks to the other question around um, sort of case studies internationally. Um, and quite a lot of the international community, particularly working in the global south, is looking at sort of cash. They've sort of moved on from construction and um, providing sort of cash and then that technical support and those processes that enables people to rebuild themselves. So I was just wondering um, what your sort of thoughts are on that. And then also there's one around um, sort of density and urbanism and where you see um, some of this working um, potentially in more urban areas or thinking about, like we talked a little bit about um, renters and this feels like you know, a lot of this is for homeowners and some of the most vulnerable people in these situations you know, are, don't own the land or their homes and I'm just wondering if you could sort of reflect on that a bit, particularly at the, the sort of policies and um, systems that Okay, so well, let me check. There's a few questions there, but um, like the idea of cash versus, um, you'll see the way, when you look at the way different communities, different countries respond with kind of building, everyone is different, like you're saying, right? And uh, some, some communities are really strong about something happens, we're going to gather our materials and build it ourselves, and we have this kind of local kind of um, a different level, kind of different, maybe a, a step less or, organized is not the right word, but dispersed kind of building network. Like more people are builders and able to kind of make things happen. And um, like for example, um, when right after Katrina hit, I lived in Biloxi, Mississippi. And Biloxi, Mississippi um, is pretty racially divided along the peninsula that kind of sticks out into the Gulf. So on the very tip of the peninsula is a very strong Vietnamese community. And those are, the, those are the communities that kind of took over the shrimping industry when it was kind of at its, at its lowest. Then there's an African American community. And they're the next, by the way, the one on the end of the peninsula, the highest risk. And those communities usually have the least amount of money, because that's, the, and that's where they were able to live. And then there's African American community, and then there's a white community kind of further inland. Well, the Vietnamese one didn't speak any English and could not begin to get around the FEMA process. They were also the first to rebuild because in their communities they set up just that. And, it, and it, you know, so they rebuilt, but the issue is that not for not trying hard, but the way that those homes were built wasn't really to code and it wasn't really built in a way that would probably withstand the next disaster. Because, but they were, they were back in their homes. The white community got, got back on their feet relatively quickly, but that's because they financed most of it themselves. And so, and the African American community was still at a high risk, but they were very, very modest communities and just didn't have the money to rebuild and but but they also recognize that they had to work within the system where the Vietnamese community just said, oh, we're just gonna kind of do this however we want to do it. 
So I'm not trying to make kind of, I know that's kind of broad strokes when it comes to cultural backgrounds, and, but, but you do obviously see environmental inequity happening differently amongst um, different communities and amongst kind of, um, you know, across geographies, right, based on what the risk that those people are dealing with in their places. So I think that cash is a great idea, but just what, what would, it, how would that exactly work in the United States, I think it's different, and we have very high standards for construction and set up regulatory processes that make it harder for really those small builders to, to make that work. The other part of your question was density. density, yeah. So for sure, this is a more dispersed approach. And if you're building, you know, in urban centers, there's just a different model for reconstruction. And often people, the ground kind of map the level of the elevation that people are living with, if you're in an apartment building, it's going to be different after a storm. So, yeah, this approach is not for a high stacked kind of, but the process, everything else, the system, the, the laws, all of that still applies. So, I don't know if that kind of answers your question. Yeah, because we still have to, they still have to go through the same processes of reconstruction, the same funding restrictions. I think we will take this conversation upstairs at the reception. Thank you so much, Omar. Thank you all for joining us.